You already know how to solve a single equation. But what happens when you're faced with several equations that all share the same variables? How can we organize them in a way that makes sense? And how can computers efficiently store and solve them? Hey there, I'm Oliver, a computer science student in my final year, focusing on AI. On this channel, I break down fundamental concepts to make AI and computer science more accessible. Today we're looking at matrices, an essential tool in both deep learning and traditional machine learning. If you haven't done so already, check out my previous video on vectors. It's a great starting point before diving into matrices. So before jumping straight into solving these equations, I will show you what matrices are. So first here, we have a vector. You're probably familiar with this from my previous video, but essentially it's an ordered list of numbers. Here we have three numbers. Now a vector only has one dimension, which means every row in this vector has one number. Now matrices are like vectors, a collection of numbers, but this time have an additional dimension, this one here. So as you can see here, we have an ordered list of numbers here and an ordered list of numbers here. So technically, this matrix A is just a collection of these two vectors here. Now we call these dimensions the rows and the columns. And when talking about the dimension of a vector, we say how many rows it has and how many columns. So this matrix, for example, has three rows and two columns, making it a three times two matrix. Now we have some basic operators for matrices and some of them you're already familiar with, namely addition, subtraction, and scalar multiplication. So I will only briefly touch on these because they work in very much the same way. Now, when we add two matrices to each other, they need to be of the same dimension, meaning they have to have the same number of rows and also the same number of columns. So here we have a three times two plus a three times two matrix. And the output will also be a three times two matrix. Like vectors, the output entry will just be the addition of each of the entries in the inputs. So in this case, we call this the entry in the first column and first row. This will be added to the entry in the first column and the first row of the second matrix. So one plus zero. And then we enter this result in the first column and first row of the output. So one plus zero is one and we get one. Now we continue this for each of the entries. And then this is our output matrix. Now scalar multiplication, again, is very similar to vectors. We multiply each of the entries by our scalar, and then the output comes into the same entry as it was in the input. So the entry one, one, so first row, first column, times two is two, and that result ends up in the first row, first column of the output. And then we continue this way. And then here is our output. Again, we have the input three rows and two columns, and our output is three rows and two columns. An operator which is not familiar from vectors is the transposition, where essentially you rotate the matrix, where the first column becomes the first row, and the first row becomes the first column. So the exact way this works is we write this first column of numbers as our first row. And then we write the second column as the second row. And then this is already our result. Now you notice that our input is a three times two matrix and out we get a two times three matrix. And this is exactly what the transposition does. It switches the dimensions and rotates or even mirrors our original matrix. Now our last operation is the matrix multiplication. This one is a bit more difficult. Here, we have a matrix of size three times two and one of two times two. We have to check for compatibility. The number of columns of the first matrix needs to match the number of rows of the second matrix. Our first matrix is always on the left side and the second one always on the right side. The outcome will be a three times two matrix. You can see what exactly the output is by having the number of rows be 
the rows of the first matrix and the number of columns being the number of columns of the second matrix. Now the result for the first row, first column, will be the multiplication of the first row of the first matrix and the first column of the second matrix. So when we talk about multiplying one row with one column, what that means is we multiply the first entry with the first entry and the second entry with the second entry and we add them all up. So in this case, one times one plus zero times zero. So in this case, it would be one. For our entry in the second row and the first column, we take the row two from our first matrix and the column one from our second matrix. And then we multiply this two here with this one here to get two, and then this one here with this zero here to get zero. So our result will be two times one, which is two, plus zero. So our entry is two. Now this continues for every single entry here, always taking the row from the first matrix and the column from the second matrix. Now I only wanted to introduce this quickly conceptually, but this is actually what allows us to write our equations from the beginning in this compact format. So here we have our equations from the beginning and writing this in matrix notation gives us exactly this formula. So on the left-hand side, you can see that we have each of these entries from our original equations. So for example, this negative C is negative one times C. So if you actually go ahead and you try to apply the matrix multiplication to this formula here, on the left-hand side, you will get as a result these entries here. Specifically, it will be a matrix of dimension three times one. So this would be one entry and would be the result of the multiplication of this row with this vector. And on the right-hand side, we would still have this entry four. So now you see that the matrix allows us to store this in a compact way where we don't write our entries A, B, and C once for each equation. And we also separate our information as now we have this vector here for our variables and this matrix for all the coefficients in these equations and a last vector to show what our expected result is. You can write this in this compact format AX equals B. Now this then encodes the system of equations we just saw and allows us to solve the system of equations. Matrices have something which are called inverses. Now these are similar to how we understand inverses for numbers like two. So the inverse, which is always to the power of negative one, of two would be one half. So that when we then multiply two times this one half, we would get one. In the same way, square matrices, so matrices where the number of columns and rows are equal, can have inverses. And this then allows us to simply with this formula here, give ourselves the solution x equals the inverse of a times b. Now, whether this inverse actually exists depends on the exact entries in the matrix. But in case it exists, it allows us with a simple multiplication of the inverse of this matrix and this vector to get our results for a, b, and c immediately. And there is a more general procedure called Gaussian elimination, which allows us to compute the solution. So our x here and in our equations a, b, and c systematically and also more generally. So matrices give us a compact way to represent and solve multiple equations at once. They also describe linear functions and play a key role in machine learning especially in neural networks. With these matrix basics, you're one step closer to applying them in machine learning. If you'd like to see how, check out my video on neural networks, which utilize matrix multiplications in their computations, or explore this other video next. Thanks for watching.